Today's a special day, guys. Uh, today we're going to be talking about metabolic syndrome. We're going to be focusing on the sciences and the understanding of what metabolic syndrome is. Today we're going to be bringing out some specialists, some people from all over the, the globe in different directions to discuss the topics of metabolic disorders and how it affects people in our local communities. The particular topic that we're going to be talking about today is, is metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome affects a whole lot of people. Now, in, in terms of it, uh, to be diagnosed with metabolic syndrome, we have to have a couple of disorders, uh, s situations that present them that are things such as blood sugar issues, high blood pressure, um, the ability to have triglycerides off, uh, high density lipoproteins, and also the measurements of belly fat in our diet. So today, one of the special things that we're going to be doing is bringing a panel to us, to you guys, to see exactly what metabolic syndrome is. Now, today is a special day because we're actually going live on Facebook Live, and we're actually presenting the information for the very first time so this is our first go at it guys so uh give us a thumb th thumbs up if you feel we did good if not tell us too also because we're learning and we're going through a process to try to get to our communities and to teach them about what's actually going on in terms of metabolic disorders we have present today a state ornelas who's going to be talking about metabolic syndrome and certain dietary nutritional uh dynamics that we can actually help improve it we also have kenavon which is our coach uh, that's going to be discussing how we actually interact with patients. We also have our patient here, who is Trudy, uh, who is actually a, a live individual who's actually has had metabolic syndrome. And in a distance, we also have Alexander Jimenez, who's actually out at the National University of Health Science and Medical School to discuss the biochemistries that are, are associated and are linked to metabolic disorders to give us a detailed information, a detailed insight, sorry, as to what metabolic syndrome is and how it affects our communities. Now, what to be important about it is, is this is a very serious subject matter. It, it seems kind of that uh, we chose this particular topic because that it's affecting so many people. So many of my patients that we see today, even though I have a musculoskeletal practice, uh, are directly related to inflammatory disorders. And when we're dealing with inflammatory issues, we're going to be dealing with insulin and how it affects the body. Now, as insulin goes in this process, every one of these particular dynamics that we're going to be discussing and we on our future podcasts uh, when we deal with metabolic syndrome are directly related to insulin and its effects on the body. So as we kind of go through this dynamics, what we want to do is we want to bring out each individual point. I have the ability to, to present today uh, Ken Yvonne, who's going to be talking about what happens when we present a patient, uh, that what we do when a patient has uh, metabolic disorders. So we're going to present it to Kenna. Kenna, can you tell us a little bit about what happens when we have a patient who presents with metabolic syndrome, what they look for what we look for and how we assess it and how we kind of treat the is yes. issues. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd love to. So when a patient first comes in and we kind of see those signs of metabolic syndrome, the patient isn't always aware because on their own, these symptoms that make up metabolic syndrome are not necessarily a red flag. However, when we start to see them getting combined, that's when we start to realize that this is something we need to take control of right now. So when that patient first comes in and they're telling us about the symptoms that they're having, we definitely start tracking it and we do a detailed history on them to see if it's something that has been going on for a long time, if it's something that's more recent, um, things like that. And then we're going to take it from there and we do more detailed lab work. And then we look at kind of the, even their genetics. Genetics are a huge part of it. And we see what diet would best work for them, and just make those realistic goals. But we also really want to make sure we give them that education that they need to be successful. Education is huge, especially when it comes to something that can be as confusing as metabolic syndrome. One of the things that um, we, we discuss is how can we give our, 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 our patients really take home um, dynamics and things of value that they can change the metabolic syndrome once we determine that someone has metabolic issues. Now, the the whole idea is to create a direct path from the kitchen to the genetics. And and somehow some way we have to we have to bring the the science all the way to the kitchen to understand what can we eat and what we can do and how we can avoid certain foods in order to change the dynamics that are being expressed at our genetic code level. So we're going to try to kind of give a little bit of broad a, a, you know expansive understanding as to the processes that can take on each one of these five particular issues one at a time. So um, in terms of, let's say, the kitchen, um, how do we actually help people help themselves in the kitchen, Kenna? 
One thing that we love to do in the kitchen is smoothies. Smoothies are so beneficial because not only are you feeding your body the right nutrients you need, you're also having that ability to feed your cells, which is what's going to actually make the difference inside your body. And you'll still feel satisfied and full, not going to be something that's, you know, you're left hungry, like you just ate a little bit of bird seed. So <laughs> it's definitely something that I recommend everybody starts with. One great thing to add into those smoothies is going to be flax seeds. So flax seeds are very high in fiber, good fiber. So if you put those flax seeds into the blender first and you blend them up, kind of opening them up, and then you start adding in your healthy fats like avocados to make your smoothie nice and smooth and the almond milk, low calorie and low carb fruits, things like that, it's really going to just unleash a powerhouse inside that gut. So one main thing that it's going to do is the fiber is really going to stick around. So it's going to feed your prebiotics and your probiotics, every single bug in that gut. And it's also going to help take things out of your body system that usually get reabsorbed, such as salt, and really let it be able to get excreted the way that it should be, rather than sticking around, like I said, getting reabsorbed and just causing these underlying issues. So these, um, these dynamics, and, and particularly when we deal with... Uh uh, flaxseed. I know Alexander knows a little bit about the flaxseed dynamics in terms of how it works with cholesterol, and and that's one of the issues, uh, the HDL component. Tell me a little bit about what you're what you've seen in terms of the flaxseed, Alex, in terms of of our experiences with flaxseed and uh, diminishment of cholesterol and uh, helping out with metabolic syndrome. So flaxseeds are really good not only in nutrients, but like uh, Kenna said, they're really good in dietary fiber. So we have to ask ourselves, why is dietary fiber essential? Um, we can't digest it, but it can bind to other things that are within our gut. And one of the main things that it does to lower cholesterol is it binds to bile. Now, bile from our gallbladder is around 95% uh, cholesterol, um, and I'm sorry, 80% cholesterol, and 95% of it most of the time gets recycled and reused. So what having, by having a large amount of um, fiber within the gut, the fiber binds to the cholesterol, and the body's mechanism to compensate from that is to pull cholesterol from other parts of the body, specifically from the uh, serum of the blood, and pull it back in to rejuvenate those levels of bile. So not only are you forcing your gut to work in the proper manner that it's meant to, but you're also lowering your cholesterol within the internal side of the body. So the component of cholesterol can be assisted by fiber. Now, I know that uh, Steve's got some ideas in terms of how to lower the blood pressure and also be able to kind of bring a little bit of, of control in terms of the nutraceuticals. And in that respect, uh, she's been going over some particular topics, and uh, she's, our, she's our resident scientist that uh, helps us see what actually the NCBI, which is the National Research Centers, that provides information on a daily basis of what's happening with metabolic syndrome out there. So she's going to be presenting a little bit of uh, kind of some nutraceutical topics that we can touch upon at this present time. Asteed, hello. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Um, so first of all, for those of those for, for those people who are barely coming into the podcast, uh, who are barely coming in to listen to us, uh, I just want to, I just want to, I guess, bring up again uh, what metabolic syndrome is. Uh, so metabolic syndrome, as many of you might know, it's not a, it's not a condition or disease in itself. It's a, it's more so a cluster of uh, a collection of, of, I guess, other health issues that can increase the risk of, uh, things like heart disease and stroke and even diabetes. So uh, with that being said, uh, metabolic syndrome doesn't have any obvious symptoms, but probably one of the most uh, visible, uh, I guess, you know, uh, health issues uh, th that are obvious in people with metabolic syndrome is uh, waste fat. So with that being said, um, some of the nutraceuticals I wanna talk about today, um, as you can see, um, I've listed several uh, nutraceuticals that I discussed uh, last time, and and these nut uh, these nutraceuticals can help um, it can help metabolic syndrome in a, in a variety of ways. But I actually added several on here that specifically target weight loss, since as I mentioned, uh, one of the obvious signs of of metabolic syndrome is that excess waste fat. So I want to bring in. Um, one of the nutraceuticals that, is, that uh, several research studies, and I've written articles on it as well, uh, 
that can help uh, promote weight loss uh, in people who have metabolic syndrome is uh, niacin. Now, niacin, it's a vitamin B3, and um, you can usually find it as a part of uh, when you buy uh, those supplements that have uh, kind of like B-complex. It has a collection of various of the, you know, the different B vitamins. And uh, uh, so niacin, uh, several research studies have found that it can help reduce inflammation uh, uh, associated with obesity. People that have excess weight, of course, uh, uh, usually these people have... Uh, increase blood sugar blood sugar levels and that can also in turn lead to inflammation so taking b vitamins taking a specifically vitamin b3 or as it's well known for niacin it can help reduce inflammation and it can also help uh promote metabolism which is our the the capacity that our body has to convert uh carbohydrates and proteins and fats into energy so when we take vitamin b's and when we take a uh, Specifically, niacin, vitamin B3, I want to emphasize that one. And research studies have, have found that it can help burn calories much more efficiently. Um, when we're dealing with niacin um, and the nutraceuticals that we're, we're going, um, I know that Alexander's got some issues. Are you still with us, Alexander? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. It's, disconnected. it's okay. It's, it's, it's all good. Uh, what I can see is we, we, we deal with, and we're having, we're learning about our technical issues as we go through them. I'm going to go back to uh, a state specifically about belly fat. Now, she had mentioned about the belly fat. Let's be very specific. When we're dealing with belly fat, we're dealing with issues where a male has a greater than a 40 inch waist. Okay. And for females, for females, they have a greater than 35. Is that correct? Yes. So when we do the measurements, that's one of the components. So as we discuss these particular issues, we want to make sure that when we're talking about the belly fat uh, and the weight gains and the BMI issues and the BIA issues, that's the basal metabolic rates and the bioimpedance assessments that we do, we we're looking for those particular aspects. So she's mentioning in the niacin. And in terms of niacin, what's your experience with niacin, Alex, with, uh, with your dynamics uh, that you have put in, in place? So niacin, uh, or other, otherwise known as vitamin B3, is a really good vitamin B um, in terms that it is the free product. It is the reactant to a certain reaction. Specifically, where it takes hold is during glycolysis as well as uh, the citric acid cycle. Now, the reason why it plays such a big role in the citric acid cycle um, is because it is used as the free product to synthesize NADH. Now, if someone's having metabolic syndrome, um, this can upregulate that citric acid cycle. So if they're trying to burn fat or use their carbohydrates on a more uh, efficient rate, it'll help upregulate that cycle and allow them to use their mitochondrial metabolism a lot better. That's awesome. Now, going back to Astrid, uh, tell me a little bit about what you, what other supplements we have here. We're gonna, we may not get through all of them, but we're little by little, we'll break this thing down. So we'll give you guys tidbits so that it, useful information so that we can take on metabolic syndrome and change people's lives. Go ahead. Okay, so the next uh, uh, nutraceuticals I'm going to talk about, I'm actually going to talk about these two together, vitamin D and calcium, specifically vitamin D3. I want to emphasize that. Uh, but uh, both of these nutraceuticals, um, they can also uh, help promote uh, fat mass loss. And uh, several research studies have also found that this one, just like, uh, just like B vitamins, just like niacin, vitamin B3, it could also help improve metabolism to uh, basically make the body uh, more efficiently uh, burn calories. And, uh, and then the next uh, nutraceuticals I wanna, that I want to talk about is uh, DHEA. Now, I want to, I guess one of the things that I want to highlight about the DHEA is that, first of all, this is a hormone. This is a hormone that's naturally produced in the body. Uh, but then, of course, uh, you know, some people uh, can supplement it. Uh, you know, if you talk to your health to your healthcare professional, I'm sorry, um, and they, they determine that you need uh, more, more DHA in your body because your body's not naturally producing enough of it, then they can supplement it as well. Uh, so specifically about the uh, DHEA, um, according to the Washington University School of, Medi of Medicine, uh, DHEA can also help metabolize fat much more efficiently by basically, so um, I guess one of the things that I wanted to discuss uh, that goes together with DHEA, so um, when we consume excess calories, you know, uh, the daily caloric intake uh, on average, according to uh, uh, researchers, uh, we need to take 2,000 uh, 2, calories, but 
So what happens to the body when we eat excess calories? Now, these calories actually get stored in the body as fat. So when we t when uh, when the, the body naturally produces, uh, I guess, sufficient amounts of DHEA, uh, our body is able to metabolize DHEA, I mean, metabolize fat, I'm sorry, much more efficiently so that our body uh, gets rid of excess fat rather than storing it. Got it. So let me ask you, DHEA is a hormone. And one of the things that... Uh that I noticed is that it being a hormone, this this is found over the counter. And one of the unique things uh, with some passages of, of recent laws is that DHEA actually made it through the FDA to be able to be used over the counter. So you'll mm -hmm. see the product being dispersed through all the stores and depending yes. on the quality, you can actually see it more common. And the reason you see it more common over the last couple of years is because the FDA found it and then through a loophole, it was allowed to remain in the markets. Go ahead, uh, Kenna wants to mention something regarding this particular component and the assessment of those particular issues. I was going to add something when it comes to, we're talking about the body fat and how um, Astrid was saying that body fat gets stored. So what happens is when you have those excess calories, you create these things in your body called triglycerides. And triglycerides are composed of glycerol and fatty acids. However, those in general, triglycerides are too big to enter in that cell membrane. So what happens is there's another hormone that controls almost everything, and it's called insulin. And the insulin gets called in. And from here, we have the lipo... Um, Lipoprotein lipase? Yes, <laughs> that <laughs> okay. one. It's a tongue twister. Um, so that gets called in, and it kind of breaks those apart. From here, now the insulin is coming in again and activating something called a GLUT4 transporter, which is going to open up that cell membrane. And now we're going to see that fat cell get stored full of the glucose and triglycerides and fat. So that's how those fat cells go from not having anything to then having those excess calories. Now they're being converted through this process. Now they're getting nice and full and they're hanging around your belly. I've noticed that certain people have more efficient uh, LPLs, which is lipoprotein lipase. Some mm -hmm. people may say that, you know what, I gain weight by just looking at food. Uh, mm -hmm. It may happen more as you get older. This particular issue is controlled by a, a whole different control system. What kind of control systems are the ones that control lipoprotein lipase and the GLUT4 along with hormone-sensitive lipase that you have there? Insulin definitely controls everything. It's and um it's like I said, it's that hormone and it's going to come in. And also on top of that, we have pH that affects um, enzymes and temperature and things along that line. You know, uh, a, a lot of things that when we look at enzymes, we, we realize that the thing that determines en enzymes activity or sensitivity or ability to function uh, is, is encoded in the genetics. Um, in terms of lipoprotein lipase and the breakdown of the fatty acids, I know, Alex, you have some some points there in terms of the fat breakdown uh, information there. What do you have there that you can help the public understand a little bit more with? So without going too much into the biochemical pathways, um, this is kind of just showing the inner uh, mitochondrial matrix of the mitochondria. So after, I guess, you've been well-fed and all your cells are satisfied with energy production through ATP synthesis, if you have an overconsumption of, of caloric intake, specifically through glucose, you end up having a large amount of acetyl-CoA being produced or kind of hanging around in the end here. So what the body does is by high levels of insulin, this enzyme called citrate synthase is induced. So what citrate synthase does is it uses oxalacetate and it uses acetyl-CoA to make citrate. Now citrate can then exit the mitochondrial matrix and then large accumulations of citrate will start accumulating in the cytosol of the cell. As that happens, uh, ATP citrate lyase will actually break them apart again and bring acetyl-CoA and oxalacetate. Because oxalacetate um, and acetyl-CoA don't have specific membrane transporters so they can't cross that mitochondrial membrane, only specific ones like citrate does. So as acetyl-CoA gets taken out into the cell, kind of taking a look over here, we have acetyl-CoA, which gets turned into malonyl-CoA. And it's actually this enzyme, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, is induced by insulin. So normally, acetyl-CoA carboxylase has a phosphate group on it, which inhibits its activity. But when it interacts with insulin, um, insulin turns on a protein phosphatase. So phosphatases are enzymes that take phosphates off. And then it becomes acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So now, acetyl-CoA carboxylase is active to make malonyl-CoA. 
Now, why is this important? So Malonque is a very, um, it's like putting the boulder on top of the hill. You're going to start a different chemical process. So what Malonque, it actually inhibits fatty acid breakdown um, and begins fatty acid synthesis. So when you start making malonocoe, you're going to, without going too much into fatty acid synthesis, the end goal is palmitate, which is a type of fatty acid. Now, palmitate chains will combine together with glucose to form a triacylglycerols. So here we can see how a large dietary intake of carbohydrates, glucose, as well as proteins, and insulin activate the formation of triacylglycerols. Um, and in the event that you are diabetic, you pretty much get halted in certain pathways and that's why you end up with too much acetyl-CoA and you have too many ketone bodies floating around in the blood. Um, so as you kind of going through without going too much in depth, we can see that having large amount of dietary triglycerols, large amounts of uh, glucose uh, will actually force more triglycerols or triacylglycerols within these chylomicrons within the lumen of the blood vessels. Um, and this is going to force a chain of reactions. So without breaking down too much here, we're kind of just showing where it's all going. So we have acetyl-CoA going to malonyl-CoA, going to palmitate. And then we have palmitate forming these triacylglycerols. So like Kenna said, these triacylglycerols can't really enter the adipocytes, the adipocytes or the fat cells without lipoprotein lipase. So with the combination of lipoprotein lipase allowing these cells to get in there, um, you allow for the storage of the fat. So the cool part to notice is that by doing so, the first one that's going to use fatty acids is going to be your heart. The heart relies around 80% of its energy from fatty acids. Then it's going to be your muscle cells. But this is in conjunction if you're exercising on a regular basis. If you're not doing that, then the adipose cells are going to favor to store the uh, triglycerides or triacylglycerides more often. And then you're also going to use more LDLs, which means you have the potential to have more oxidized LDLs, causing a higher event of atherosclerosis formation. You know, as you as you go through this process, it it, it it's for you. It seems kind of a uh, um, natural, but for 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 a lot of us, it's a deep deep story, and a, a, and it's far and it's dynamic. And what I want to do is I want to bring the people back to Kenna as to the diets. Okay, in terms of of bringing this basic to understanding, how is it that we we assess an individual with these particular issues? I can assure you that when we we first assess a metabolic syndrome patient, we do a lot of blood work, a lot of blood assessment, a lot of enzyme testing. We can even do DNA testing. So we got to be able to go back to a patient and, and describe exactly how we can better improve their lives by the assessments that we do. So Kenna, you got some, some cool stuff there for us. What do you have in front of you? Yes, in front of me, I have a sample report from one of our patients who we ran the DNA blood test on. And one of those things that we can see is that there's a gene pulled up right here and it's called TAS1R2. And what this gene does is it's actually a tissue that can be found in the gastrointestinal tract, the hypothalamus, and the pancreas. And it's known for regulating your metabolism and energy and homeostasis. Also, it affects that food intake beyond the detection of your sweet taste on the tongue. What does that mean? So what that means is it's basically <laughs> nicknamed the sweet gene. So somebody who has this gene is more likely to be drawn to sweet foods because it's almost like their sweetness is enhanced. So when they taste ice cream, it's a 10 out of 10, no matter the flavor versus someone who doesn't have this gene, maybe it's more of a 7 out of 10. They're just, it hits them differently, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. sense. There's yeah. some people that just, you know, they love that ice cream and that mm -hmm. dynamics. I know that uh, I want to take a little bit of a detour because a lot of patients will wonder, well, what do we got to do to get uh, into, be assessed, and what kind of things we can, how does someone get, where do they go? And for that, we have our clinical liaison here, Trudy, who basically walks patients in and first determines that the patient is a qualified because we do have questionnaires that assess the determination of if someone is a qualified individual or does have presentations that are predisposing of metabolic syndrome that require further assessment. And once we do in the situation that a person does have it, they want to understand what to do. So I, Trudy, you do uh, help people and guide them through the process. What is it we do in our office to help guide an individual through uh, the beginnings of a metabolic assessment? Okay, well basically, you know, when people call in, we go ahead and email them a questionnaire. 
It does take, it does take about 45 minutes because it's a very in-depth questionnaire. We definitely want to pinpoint and get to the bottom of their main concerns, the main issues that we're going to target in order for the process to be successful. Once we get the questionnaire back, then we go ahead and set up an appointment with Dr. Jimenez and our health coach, Kenna, and then we'll go in depth as far as what are the target areas that we need to address in order for the process to be successful. Um, and that's one of the things that I wanted to ask Kenna because I know it can be a little bit overwhelming as far as what is it that they get and as far as what is the next process. So once we get the questionnaire, I know that that's when they're gonna go ahead and do the different type of um, lab work to determine what is gonna be successful in the kitchen. I know you see the patients when they walk in. How do they feel in terms of that, Trudy? When, how do they, what is it they, they, they typically will tell you prior to being further assessed? Well, they're tired of you know all the different changes that you go through as unfortunately as we age, you know, some of the DNA genes that we have that they're dormant, you know, they, they become active. And that's when you start experiencing different type of uh, syndromes, you know, like the metabolic syndrome. Uh, and that's one of the things that we address, you know, that we go ahead and do your, the DNA testing and, and see what uh, different genes are dormant that are not dormant anymore. I, I think active. that also, it, you know, whether you've noticed too, and you've mentioned this to me, they're just tired of feeling bad. They're just tired of feeling like, I guess crap is a good word, right? So the, right. It, 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 it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 they're tired of just, they don't recover. They don't sleep well. They, they feel stressed. They feel like they're being choked with high blood pressure. Uh, they're, it's not, their lives are different. They're in the stress. They don't sleep. Um, so these are issues that the patients when they present to you, and I know you help them guide them. And then, Kenna, tell me a little bit about the assessments that you do in order to really qualify an individual to be on the metabolic syndrome programs that we have. So like we were saying before, we go through that detailed history to look at that family history. And then we also decide, like Ms. Trudy was saying, the lab work. The lab work is really what gives us a lot of these underlying answers because the lab work we do is more detailed than the basic so we get more numbers, we get more genetic codes, we get more of all of these things. And from there, we're able to take it and see what's going to be the most successful path for this patient. What supplements are they going to be able to intake better? What diet is best for them? Whether it be the ketogenic diet or the Mediterranean diet, everybody's body is different because everybody's insulin sensitivity is different and everyone's hormones are different changing especially for females it's different than male patients and we really create that individualized um, package for them because we want them to leave at the end of their at the end of everything not just that first visit but we want them to leave feeling empowered and healthy and strong and not just they're alive but that they're living and that makes a huge difference to their families and their friends and just everything gets impacted all from the start of these questionnaires. You touched on a subject matter there about being left alone. Um, we, we go through a process and we do keep connectivity with our patients. With today's technology, there's no reason why we can't have uh, a person or an individual connected to our office and being able to give us information such as BMI, BIA information, which is basal metabolic stuff, the scale weight, uh, the fat densities. We can have this information. Today we have Fitbits that connect to us and we can really understand that uh, that data is now flowable in a private way and, uh, and someone on the other side is reading that. Tell us what you do with individuals in terms of the coaching that we offer people for specific metabolic syndrome. Of course, for coaching, we have a scale. And like Dr. Jimenez was saying, this scale not only tells you your weight, but it also sends your weight, your um, water intake, your how, how much of your weight is water weight, how much of your weight is lean muscle, and it also tells us, um, it can track it and see the percentages of where you're changing. So we can track that maybe the number on the scale hasn't moved. And some people might start to feel discouraged. But when we look at the numbers of what that scale actually tells us, we can see that you are losing body fat and it's being replaced by muscle. So even though that number is the same, your body inside is chemically changing. You're making those differences you need to make to keep up with it and not to quit because that can, like I said, it can be discouraging for certain people. So there's and, a mind-body connection here. There's a mental, right. there's a mental component, um, a teamwork uh, dynamics that is really important when we're working through metabolic syndrome. We just can't mm -hmm. leave people here, here, just take the football and run 80 plays. No, you need to have huddles each time mm -hmm. to discuss and, and, and change the, the adaptive processes. 
Um, you know, in terms of um, the the other areas with with fat analysis, I know Alex has got some additional areas, and and Asti is going to be discussing in a few minutes. But I'm going to focus on Alex right now in terms of telling us a little bit about what what people can do with exercise or fitness that could stimulate or dynamically change their metabolic processes at the biochemical level. Well, I would first, in all honesty, is be honest with yourself. Um, you are probably going to be the best uh, observer of your own situation. Um, we all know what foods we do well with. We all know what foods we don't do well with. And we've always kind of had some sort of intuition um, as we've grown into the people we are today, knowing what foods work well for us and what foods don't work well for us. For example, myself, um, I know that if I have a large consumption of carbohydrates, I tend to put on weight pretty easily. But I am pretty active, so the days that I do have strenuous activity, I make sure that I do have a balanced meal with proteins, fats, and a decent amount of carbohydrates. But the days that I'm not very active or haven't gone to the gym, I make sure that my most of my caloric intakes come from, comes from good fats or proteins. And that's going to be the best thing is just be honest with yourself, see how you're doing, um, find your BMI, find your basal metabolic rate, and then start putting numbers to paper because if you keep track of things, odds are you're going to do better and be able to control the way that your body's responding. Um, the next thing is uh, I would find a health coach that's just kind of to stay on track and find any recommendations. The good part is that we have the internet out there and sources like yourself, Dr. Jimenez, that are able to provide um, information to the public on a new level and be able to understand and grasp the concept from a different perspective and give people more information that they didn't know that they had at their fingertips. I'm going to take it back to us, Jade. Thank you, Alex. Um, but one of the things is I want people to understand we're going to assault. We're going to do assault uh, on, by, on metabolic syndrome because this is a big problem, and it's affecting so many in all communities around the United States. And we have to have an open forum to be able to open up. And sometimes we just don't have 10 seconds. This is not a 10-second, two-minute thing. We have to really understand that there needs to be a teamwork uh, integrative medicine approach that really helps the patient. So I know she's, we're going to go with a couple of, I don't think we make it through all of them, but we're going to get through <laughs> as best as we can because uh, for dynamic and time purposes, uh, this is all recorded and can be used later. Um, tell us a little bit about the Omega, Berberine, and, and all the other supplements that you had planned on talking about. Um, okay. Uh, well, first of all, for those of for those of you who are barely coming into the uh, jumping into the podcast right now, uh, the nutraceuticals that are currently listed up there, uh, they can all help uh, uh, improve metabolic syndrome in one way or another. The majority of these specifically target, uh, they specifically lower, uh, help lower the, the risk factors that that can cause uh they can increase the risk of developing uh, issues like like heart disease, stroke, and uh, diabetes. But I, as of right now, I want to emphasize on several of these because they do uh, they're more efficient at uh, at uh, promoting weight loss uh, associated with metabolic. You know, uh, if you want to improve metabolic syndrome, you want to promote weight loss. You know. Uh, so uh, the, the the last uh, the last nutraceutical we talked about that's up there was a uh, DHEA. Uh, but the next uh, nutraceutical I want to talk about is NRF2. Uh, so it, just like DHEA, DHEA, uh, DHEA is a naturally produced hormone in our body. Well, NRF2 is also found in our body naturally, uh, but unlike DHEA, which is a hormone, NRF2 is actually the, the the name I guess the full name of it is uh, the NRF2 pathway. It's it's what's known as a transcription factor, or it's basically it, it's it's basically an element that regulates uh, uh, several cell processes, if you will. And uh, so I've done uh, quite a few uh, articles on this on this myself, and uh, there's several research studies out there. Quite a few. To be to be exact, that uh, that NRF two uh, can also help improve metabolism. So if you improve your metabolism, especially in people who have metabolic syndrome, uh, your metabolism can can make it much more efficient for you to burn calories and there, there, therefore burn fat more efficiently. The um, the omegas and and NRF two and omegas what we're dealing with here as a as, along with berberine uh, is inflammatory issues. Okay, mm -hmm. so yes. what we want to deal with is when when someone has uh, 
metabolic syndrome, we, we suffer from inflammation and inflammation is rampant and that's what's causing the discomfort, the joint pain, the overall swelling, the bloating. Uh, those are the kind of things that help uh, and they affect the blood pressure in insulin does have, we haven't talked about that yet, but we're going to be discussing that. Mm -hmm. I know um, Alex has got some ideas in terms of NRF2 factors and omegas uh, and berberine and tell me a little bit about what you've, you've seen in terms of nutraceuticals and you read in terms of its effect on metabolic syndrome, Alex. <clears throat> So the way that we need to look at the different types of fatty acids is that most of the surface of each cell is composed of a fatty acid. And it depends what type gets incorporated based on the consumption or dietary intake that you have on a daily basis. So the main two components that your body's going to use is uh, cholesterol. Um, that's why we still need cholesterol and healthy fats that we get. But at the same time, if you're taking in a lot of red meats, you're also going to use uh, a arachidonic acid, which makes different types of fatty acids. And it also makes a, uh, a transcription factor called PG2, which is known for its very infl inflammative uh, process or uh, aspects. So what fish oils do, specifically EPA, uh, EPA and DHA, is by incorporating these into the cell membrane, you actually upregulate uh, NRF2 and downregulate uh, NF kappa B, which is the uh, inflammatory response. Um, and not only by doing that, but like we talked about before with green tea extract as well as uh, turmeric or otherwise known as curcumin, these also inhibit the pathways for uh, inflammation. Now, there could be the argument, well, do these um, pathways inhibit the inflammation? So let's say I get sick or something, right? Well, the cool part is that there are two different pathways stimulating the same response. Um, by doing the dietary regimen of curcumin, fish oils, or even green tea, you're inhibiting it from the body overexpressing these genes. Now, if you still um, get sick in a sense, right, you could still allow these cells to proliferate, specifically your macrophages, um, to do their job correctly. So you're not inhibiting them by overstimulating them. You're actually allowing them to be more proficient in their job. And in the event that you are virally infected or with some unknown pathogen or um, let's say a cell decides to go rogue and um, start producing uh, cancerous cells, you allow the body to be more proficient in its terms of extraction of these pathogens. In essence, what we've learned is that if we try to suppress inflammation, we really create a huge problem. Uh, the question is, let's stop inflammation from progressing to be too extreme. So in essence, to keep it at a workable uh, dynamics. And that's what these curcumins and the green teas do. I know uh, Steve's got something to mention in terms of this particular concept. Tell me a little bit about what you're thinking about. Um, yeah, so uh, like Alex mentioned, green tea is actually a fantastic drink. It's actually, it's it's in my nutraceutical list that's up there. And I, I really wanted to talk about green tea because uh, it's a very easily accessible drink. Uh, you know, for those of you that like tea, uh, green tea is delicious as well. And uh, green tea, uh, there's a variety of research studies that have actually been demonstrated to be uh super beneficial for uh, people with metabolic syndrome. So uh, as many of you know, green tea actually contains caffeine. Of course, it has it has much less uh, caffeine than a cup of coffee, for example, but it still does have caffeine. And uh, green tea itself is also, it is a powerful antioxidant. That's another of the things that it's very well known for. Um, but just like just like NRF2, uh, you know, the, the pathway, the NRF2 pathway, uh, green tea has actually been demonstrated to uh, help improve metabolism tremendously. You know, like it promotes the, the body's ability to, to burn calories, to burn fat. And uh, because of its caffeine, uh, I guess, amount, because e even though it is less than a cup of coffee, but it's just enough. Uh, it can actually help improve exercise performance. And, you know, for those people who are looking for to, to lose weight because of uh, uh, the, the, you know, the issues that they have associated with metabolic syndrome, uh, drinking green, green tea can actually help promote and improve their exercise performance so that they're, more, they're able to uh, pretty much engage and participate uh, more, much more efficiently in their exercise and physical activity to therefore burn fat. So, Shady, so basically you're indicating that as a good option, instead of, a, let's say, a, a, a whatever kind of drink or a juicy drink, it's wise to keep 
kind of in the background green tea throughout the day. Is that correct? Or, or to how much the water is good, the green tea is good, a little bit of coffee, and a little bit of this uh, fluid is important to keep our bodies hydrated through the process. Since it's already mm -hmm. available, green tea is a great option not only for metabolic processes to stop inflammation, mm -hmm. but also to to actually help with the burning of the fat too, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, green tea is a, it's a great drink. You can pretty much have it uh, throughout your day. You know, uh, it has less caffeine than say, you know, than, than coffee, as I mentioned. And uh, it, it will, uh, you know, for those people that have a uh, green tea, I, I personally love green tea and I will have it. And you do get that, that little, that extra amount of, of energy. You feel it when you have green tea. Uh, um, but, uh, definitely, yeah, you can have it throughout your day and, you know, it's important to stay hydrated, drink plenty of water and you just want to make sure that if you do exercise enough, you don't want to lose your, your electrolytes. So, you know, drink plenty of water and just stay hydrated. I know go we're, I, I, so. go ahead. I know that we're going over there. I know Kenna wants to speak something and we, we're going to go in that direction right now because Kenna wants to talk about specifically dietary changes and also things that we can do from a health coach point of view. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that green tea is super beneficial going off of a street's point, but I personally don't like drinking green tea mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that all hope is lost. They do mm -hmm. have green tea in capsules as well. So you can still get all of those great benefits without actually drinking it mm -hmm. because for some people it's, you know, they're coffee over tea. So you don't have to drink <laughs> yes. the tea. You can still get all those great benefits that Astrid was talking about, but through um, capsules. Yeah, we got uh, really interesting sneaky ways that we can help people. <laughs> in, in, in order to help people understand and to come into our office, what can they do, uh, Trudy, in terms of being able to be facilitated in the office if they want to make, if they want to, if they have questions or for any doctor that they have out wherever they may be? Because this is reaching far. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I know this can be very overwhelming to just the regular population. You know, we went in too deep, you know, as far as all the physiology behind it and, and, and everything else. One of the things that I can tell you, rest assured, that when you do call our office, uh, we're, one, we're going to walk you step by step. You're not going to be alone. You're going to walk out with a lot of information and know specifically what works for you. Like Hannah was saying, everybody's different. This is not a cookie cutter program. We definitely take the time and we walk, we talk one-on-one -on -one with everybody that walks in and make sure that when they walk out and they have a lot of information with them, they also walk out with not just the lab work, they will walk out with recipes. Um, Kenna is gonna be constantly following up with you. It's extremely a successful approach when you have accountability from a health coach. Um, so you're not gonna be by yourself. You know, um, again, we're, we're, our goal is to take the kitchen all the way to the genes and from the genes all the way to the kitchen. We got to give the uh, understanding, maybe not of the deep biochemistry as, as Alex has taken us into or the, uh, the nutraceutical dynamics. Just know that there are ways that we can monitor, we can assess, we can periodically evaluate. We have diagnostic tools to, to, to determine blood assessments that are way beyond what was done 10 years ago. We have uh, metabolic dynamic testing that we do in our office to determine real critical aspects of the weight density, the, the limb weight, the, the body, how much water you have. We, we use things like phase angle to determine the health of the cells uh, and how they're functioning. So there's a lot that goes on in this process. So I wanna take the opportunity to thank my, my guests today because from Alexander all the way far on the north side of the United States to Astid who actually assesses things at the, at the NCBI because we need to have our finger right on the research that's been done. Mm -hmm to our clinical liaison, which is Trudy, and our one of our one of our dynamic health coaches. Uh, I can be a health coach, but sometimes I'm with a patient, but she's really with you all, all the time, and she can connect with you via email, mm -hmm. uh, which is Kenna. So together we have come with uh, an intention, and our intention is very clear, to understand what, what the process is of metabolic syndrome, to break it down to deep levels, to all, we'll get down to the, as you can see, to the genes, to all the way to the kitchen and that's what our goal is so that we we educate people on how to feed our children we we intuitively know how to feed our families moms know exactly what to do however the the, the technology and the research of today offers us an ability to break it down and to be very, very specific into the sciences. And sometimes when we get a little older, we, we realize that our bodies change and our genetics change, and that's preordained based on our, our past, our peoples, our ontogeny, uh, which is the past of the 
generations in the past. But we we got to realize that we can make a change and we can stimulate, we can activate genetic codes, we can suppress uh, genes that want to get going to get active if you improperly diet the the, the or actually in, in, do an improper diet. And, so our goal today is to bring this awareness. And I want to thank you guys all for giving us the opportunity to listen in. We look forward to bringing in different subjects, maybe not as intense but or dynamic, but this was our first run at the process, and we're going to learn. And please ask questions so that we can kind of make it better for you and to give you the information you need. So we thank you very much, and I want to, and I want to tell you from all of us out here in El Paso, we look forward to being able to offer the world information into metabolic syndrome that affects so many people. So thank you guys. Thank you for everything.